So first of all, I would like to speak about the background of this uh, topic. Recently, uh, there has been a wholesale attack on Islamic institutions. I'm a historian of medieval Islamic societies, economic historian of medieval Islamic societies, and recently there has been a major put down of Islamic institutions as the basic cause for Islamic decline today. Those of you who are a little bit familiar with the situation, I refer to Timo Kura, several works, Eric Cheney, and my dear friend Avner Greif, who actually began, uh, shall we say, the trend. Um, I have been uh, trying to put things right for quite some time, and my recent book, the one I'm, I'm writing on today, of which chapter two is what you're going to hear today, uh, basically uh, shows that these people are really don't know what they're talking about. They don't know very much about Islamic uh, history, Islamic economic history. And uh, I would like to convince you uh, with me that uh, this time, the time has come to uh, adopt a different attitude. As we're going to see, there is a, for the evidence, for the empirical evidence, a very strong connection between what was happening with the Jewish communities in Egypt, I'm talking about the Geniza period, and what we are going to see. Avram Yudovic started with using the Geniza for economic history in Islam in his book, uh, Partnership in Islamic Law. And for some reason, he stopped writing and is not progressing with this anymore. But I'm going to uh, talk about this uh, as well. Very briefly, what I'm claiming, and obviously demonstrating it empirically, that the Muslims, when they arrived in the Middle East, went through a major transformation, structural economic transformation occurred in the Middle East, which resulted in a period of economic growth. <laughs> Long term enough, I would say at least 300 or 400 years, but that it has a major impact later on because it impacted the formation of Islamic law. I'll talk about this in a moment. The several structural uh, changes that I'm following is first of all demographics, second, a, 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 a property rights, and third, uh, changes in occupational structure in the Middle East. There is also <laughs> urbanization rates, which I cannot go into, but it's part of the entire picture. So this is the basic structural changes that have occurred in the Middle East. Obviously, I cannot go into all of them right now. And I have chosen the second chapter, which deals with property rights. And I demonstrated by what happened to women under Islamic law. And again, you're going to see that uh, it involves a major uh, a misconception about Muslim women and, uh, and Islamic law. So I will go immediately into what I want to say. So this is basically the chart that I'm uh, uh, showing. You can see economic change occurred in the early Middle East. And here I'm talking mostly in the beginning, we're talking about the impact of the Justinian plague, which together with reoccurrences began in the sixth century all the way down to the eighth century and continuously caused low population level, long-term low population levels until the ninth century. This has a long-term effect for a variety of uh, reasons. Most importantly for our subject today, it allowed women to enter labor markets. And as we know today, economic <coughs> empowerment follows women attachment to labor market. We have a medieval precedence in this case as well. So please remember this structure as I go on forward. What are my sources? What am I talking about? 
literary sources in Islam, plenty, plenty, as, as many as you want. Qualitative evidence comes from a variety, chronicles, geographers, historians, legal material, plenty. There is no reason to refer to economic history in medieval Islam by saying Muhammad was a trader and his wife Khadija was a trader as well. This is not it, people. This is incorrect. I have seen it happening. So I have two uh, monographs that provide us with the qual qualitative evidence. One of them deals with labor, labor structures. The other one deals with uh, uh, women and property rights, which are there. I won't talk about this anymore. Much more interesting is, up until now, we did not have statistics to say anything meaningful about women and also about economic, Islamic economic history in general. This is going to change if we look in the direction of the Geniza as previous scholars have done. For my purpose, I have uh, created a big data collection of ketubot, marriage contracts that Jews in medieval Egypt have left behind, which Goitan already collected and arranged to his, his own interest, his needs. These documents are available in my set. A women's property rights in Islamic law, I have covered in my book that was published by Harvard University Press, all the Islamic legal schools regarding women's property rights. They're all qualified. So in terms of theory, fic, everything is there. Practice, I followed also uh, enforcement through archival court documents as well as through fatwas. Fatwas are court decisions, uh, basically consultation with jurists about actual cases, and they are a marvelous source of information. Now, here's a table of all property rights that come to Muslim women. I begin with the uh, mandatory rights, and here very strong resemblance to Jewish ketubas and uh, Islamic marriage contracts. Women receive a dowry, or if you want a bride price, or mohar, and so on and so forth, mandatory, namely they have to. There is no marriage without this payment. Most women, I would say almost all of them, received also a family gift at the moment of marriage. This family gift is legal, it's written into the marriage contract, most important, all these rights are hers. They don't become part of the husband. They don't become part of the conjugal property. For all intents and purposes, there is no conjugal property in Islamic law. Namely, whatever she brings into the marriage remains hers for the rest of her life and the duration of her marriage. Same thing with the husband's property. Her property rights involved the right to make a gift, to receive a gift, to endow. She inherits less than, a, 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 let's say, daughter inherits half of what son inherits, but she inherits by law. This is contemporary with Islamic law today just to anticipate your uh, question. So this is very important. She is able to do with her money whatever she wants. A state is limited by Quranic heirs, namely two thirds of the property goes automatically to certain heirs, but third of her property she is able to uh, endow. There are several other uh, rights that are going to be important. I have 10 minutes, okay. So let me uh, go forward. Uh, property rights, what I call over the body, because in the chapter on demographics, which I have no time to go into, I also speak about the development of voluntary birth control in Islamic law. Basim Musalam, those of you who are uh, familiar with the work, established very clearly 
how they think and work. So before the demographic transition in Europe, we do have voluntary uh, uh, in Islamic law. Okay, let me move on. So here is a, a summary of women's uh, uh, property right. I highlight the right to receive wages and the right to keep the wages because that's where we're going to see what is going to happen in, later on. Compliance, enforcement, very meticulous. We have the legal documents to show it. Now I go into the statistics and here I have used all the Geniza uh, marriage contracts. Why? Because of the similarities that exist in the structure, in the contract, the marriage contract between Islamic marriage contract and Jewish marriage contract, as well as uh, our knowledge of standards of living in, uh, medieval, in the medieval uh, Middle East. Okay, now we come to the Jewish uh, connection. Goitain, when Goitain was reading all these ketubot and writing them down, he said, there's something very interesting happening here. All these Jewish brides, when they get married, when they go to write their marriage contract, demand an additional clause in the contract, which says, whatever she earns is going to be hers. Namely, she's going to keep control over her wages. There is no mention of the uh, inheritance. Jewish women do not inherit, unlike Muslim women. But very, it's suggesting to us that something was happening in terms of wages. Moving on. Here we have some statistics of what I have uh, uh, done with those uh, uh, ketubot. Bright price, there is early bright price, later bright price, averages, and so on. Family gifts, also, we have uh, numbers. I followed here Goy times, he said poor, uh, uh, middle class, rich, and so on. I followed him for that matter. Wages, wages are a problem. There's no wages in medieval Europe either. And there is no wages for Muslim women or for Jewish women for that matter. We don't know. <coughs> what I have done, I adopted the European paradigm that women earned 50 or three quarters of unskilled wages of a man, for which I do have evidence. With Professor Pamuk from uh, uh, Bohazici University in uh, Istanbul, we have published in the Journal of Economic History statistic or calculation of standards of living in, uh, in the Middle East, in the medieval Middle East, and we have provided some benchmark for wages. So I have men's wages, I moved on and calculated 50%, 66% of men's wages for women. That allowed me to have more or less a, 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 an idea of what was women lifetime worth. I call it net because unlike men, women don't have to pay anything into the household. They don't have to pay for lodging, they don't have to pay for food, they don't have to pay for clothes, which men have. The husband has to support, the woman does not. So, moving on into conclusion. What do I see happening? Property rights for women were very important, right? They were given. Islamic society went through a change from common property rights, which were practiced in Arabia, when Arabs were moving around with herds and all property was held together. Once into the Middle East, Islamic law shows us Okay. Islamic law shows there were property rights. There is individual rights which are given to men and surprisingly to women. Right? So we try to understand what were the economic conditions that led to women's property rights. It's not something straightforward, it's not something that we can understand. We use usually some context, I would say, from recent literature from Europe. I refer mostly for uh, Jan Leuten van Zanden and uh, a group of uh, students of his who came out with a whole new uh, explanation 
about uh, the role of women, empowerment of women, legal uh, uh, friendly institution and so on. When it comes to Islam, I think that the fact that women went into labor markets, for which I have documented in my book, I won't go into this, and received wages together with property rights, which gives them complete power and control over these wages, things started to change and to move forward towards inclusion of this law as the law of, uh, uh, of society, beginning with social norms and moving into, uh, uh, into law. Why is this important? Because the fact that women entered the <coughs> labor market affected the economy in two ways. First of all, division of labor, which is another structural change that I can document, or which I have already documented in my first book on labor, but also that women played an important role in production, especially in the textile industry. And textile are one of these, those manufactured items that society with a certain standards of living began to demand and to consume. Very important. Secondly, household worth has changed. Once women became to earners, you have a two earners household, you have income that has been coming to women throughout the entire structure of the marriage contract as we see the, the, the value the income that is being now, uh, uh, if you want, transferred to women has been growing. This is basically the reason why uh, men, Muslim men, supported it and why Muslim men found it worthwhile. So, very similarly to what we can find in European history, we find that women, uh, females' attachment to labor market was an important factor. Like today, it affected a household income and it affected women's empowerment. And now the question is, what about Jewish women, right? What about this clause? Is that an innocent clause that Jewish women wanted to have in their ketubah? Or does it have any significance? What kind of historical significance can we add to it. Uh, yes, I, I, this is the conclusion. Mordechai Akiva Friedman suggested, he didn't engage in this, but he suggested that the family gift that goes to Jewish women is actually the daughter's share in her father's estate. This is absolutely plausible because this is the pattern of inheritance that we find in Southern Europe. Maybe yes, maybe no. Goitain looked at this clause that says women want to have control over their wages, and he says Jewish society was poor in Egypt. So this is why uh, uh, women wanted to hang on to, uh, to their wages. Maybe, maybe not. What I'm suggesting is that there is a close similarity between Islamic law here and the demand of Jewish women to include uh, this extra clause in their uh, marriage. So in that, res in that respect, I support completely the Yudovitz Goitain school of thought about similarities between Jewish societies and Muslim societies. <laughs>